Hello everyone. Let's uh, get ourselves up to speed here, or me, so I can get up to speed with y'all. And when I see the chat box, please let me know if you can hear me okay. And let's see. That camera looks okay. I think we'll go with that. So. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Matthias. Hello, Lunar. Okay, great. Thank you. Now I know sound works. <laughs> I have got a topic for you guys today. Let's make sure I've got myself set up correctly here. I feel like there's a better way to lay this out real quick. All right, that should work. So today's topic is going to be about dosing. And, wow, I didn't bring any of the products over here with me like I'd planned to. I was kind of scrambling. I did my water testing, but then I did not uh, bring over the goodies I wanted to bring. So we're going to pantomime today. But the point of this live stream today is going to be about dosing specifically. We've talked about alkalinity in a previous video, and I'm going to go ahead and put a link to that in the description later after this is uploaded. And uh, I want to talk about calcium and magnesium today, but the actual just generic topic of dosing, I don't think we, I, I checked my channel. There's no actual physical video specifically to this topic. I think I've talked about it in lots of videos as a piece of the video or answering a question. So today we're gonna to focus on that because it's absolutely essential that you dose when you run a reef tank. Um, I know there will be people that will later on comment on this video and say, I just do water changes and don't dose anything and my reef is great. Let's keep in mind that those people may not have SPS reefs like I do. I know I could not run my reef without some kind of automatic dosing happening every single day to replace the things that are being used by the corals, which would be alkalinity, calcium, magnesium. They also like strontium, they like iodine. There's a lot of things that they use that comes from our salt mixes, but unless you're changing water all the time, you're not gonna be able to keep it up. So that's why we're discussing that today. Now, uh, 15, 17, 18 years ago, people used Kalkwasser as a way to top off their aquarium to replenish alkalinity and calcium the cheapest way possible. And it works. A matter of fact, I just talked to a, a person that's been in the hobby now for over 30 years, and he is ready to set up his reef tank again, and he's gonna use Kalkwasser. So it's a tried and proven method. If you want to go that route, the only thing I wanna tell you that you should be very careful with Kalkwasser is an overdose. And way back in those years, a long time ago, like I mentioned, I would read thread after thread after thread of people that killed their reef because their caulkwasser overdosed. So what does that mean? Uh, let's say you set up a top-off system to replace water for evaporation, and you decide to put caulkwasser in that container. Then, gradually throughout the day, as water is replaced into the tank, what happens is you're sending caulkwasser in. So you're adding alkalinity and calcium with every single shot of top-off. But if your skimmer goes crazy and decides to overflow and dumps out next to the sump or dumps out into a bucket adjacent, something that is left unchecked, what can happen is it will just continue to drain and drain and drain caulkwasser into your system because it's replacing all this water that's being lost. And what happens is the tank turns milky white and everything inside is dying. And it's very fast. Now I can tell you this, if you ever have a caulkwasser overdose, you're gonna to wanna to use white vinegar to fix it. And I'm gonna tell you to go to Google and find out what that recipe is for your tank, you know, because you know, your tank is 100 gallons and you need to lower it this much uh, in pH and it will say exactly how much uh, the uh, white vinegar to use to bring down that number to help hopefully save some of your fish. But rather than having to go to all that, I would recommend that you don't use Kalkwasser as your top off. Do top off for top off and do Kalkwasser as its own independent vessel. And you know, I tried it for, uh, I don't know, maybe a month and it was just messy and I didn't like it. Now there are Kalkwasser reactors and they, I, I've seen one from Two Little Fishies years ago that came out that had like a sprinkler head in it. And what it would do is every once in a while it would just like burst into the reactor and create create all this cavitation within to get the caulkwasser in suspension. And then uh, it would turn off again, and as the water cleared, you would be dosing that clear liquid. 
And uh, that's one method that's semi-automated. Of course, the best automation would be to have a dosing pump that draws from your, your bucket, your barrel, your reservoir of Kalkwasser and send in a fixed amount once a day or maybe twice a day. Um, and hopefully you do not have a dosing pump that has failed you that has gone crazy and is just dosing, dosing, dosing. See, again, we're right back to the same problem of something being added to your system nonstop that could harm it. Uh, a couple more things about Kalkwasser and I'm moving on. Um, whenever you mix Kalkwasser, you take the powder and you mix it with water, uh, RODI water, I was thinking salt water. <laughs> and uh, I haven't used it in so long, but then you let it settle and the liquid in between the skin on the surface and the, the sediment on the bottom, you want that liquid in the middle. So if you could pour that clear liquid into a container and then have that dose into your system, you could do it. And you know, it's not like this is crazy outdated information because public aquariums use Kalkwasser every single day because it's cost effective. So uh, they set up a five gallon barrel, or I'm sorry, bucket, on the edge of the top of the aquarium that's 1500 gallons and they have it just dripping in Kalkwasser until the bucket is empty and they refill that once a day and that's their job. If I were to do it with my reef, I would be similarly cautious rather than having a large vessel that's mixed up with a week's worth or longer, I'd make a daily dose because the stuff is so dangerous. <laughs> and uh, let me just explain why. Kalkwasser has a pH of 12. What's your reef tank at? 8.1, 8.3, ideally. Uh, dumping in 12, what do you think your livestock's gonna do? So that's why you use the white vinegar to bring down that pH as quickly as possible if there was an overdose. And that's why you need to do the research so you're ready now you can put a note by your aquarium, in case of overdose, use five tablespoons of white vinegar or whatever it is that you need for your tank. So keep that in mind. Uh, don't let the skin get in your tank. Don't let the sediment in the bottom get in your tank. Uh, Eric, I'm gonna answer some questions a little bit later because I wanna get into the next part. Um, calcium, and you're kind of talking about that right here. Calcium is another thing that we dose on a regular basis and we want to aim for a number between 375 and 425. And that is our target range, somewhere in the middle of that. And you want to stay there as much as you possibly can. If your uh, calcium is crazy high, the simplest solution is to stop dosing calcium. You continue to dose your alkalinity. Um, and if you're dosing magnesium, you continue to dose magnesium. But just stop running calcium for the time being and let the, the reef use it up. If that's not working for you because your tank is filled with softies and you just overdose calcium, they're never going to absorb that much. You may have to do a really large water change to equalize the system once more. Magnesium is a, a number that we want to keep somewhere around 1280, 1300. My preference is 1400 and that's PPM. And I like that higher number because Montipora love magnesium. And if you have a higher magnesium level, your Montiporas tend to be quite colorful. And when your magnesium is lower, uh, they look more pale. So I, I shoot for around 1400, but it's really hard with my tank. <laughs> uh, I've mentioned this in the past. I used to use a brand of salt called Cybon. And every bag of salt that I, had, you know, that I mixed up measured at 1600. So my tank was at 1600 for three years until I used up all the salt. And that was super. I never had to dose magnesium once. And the, there was no real detriment uh, that I observed in my own reef, but typically the higher the magnesium content in your aquarium, the harder it is on your, on your snails. They become um, kind of frozen in place. I'm trying to think of the right terminology, but basically it, it, it atrophies their muscles and they stop moving. So people in the past that would raise magnesium really high in an effort to kill a certain type of algae were really, uh, affecting their cleanup crew detrimentally. So, you know, it was a temporary thing that you did for two months or so, and then you'd bring it back down again, again, through huge water changes, because nothing's gonna absorb that much magnesium that quickly. But uh, with my reef, I have been mixing up a gallon of magnesium about once a month. And I was just checking my jug right now to see where it was at. <laughs> and uh, I mix that up once a month. I use magnesium pronto. It's from Two Little Fishies. And the reason I like that product is it's a small jar, retails 20 bucks, and I can get five gallons of magnesium out of one container. I, I find it to be a great deal. I'm not mixing two different parts together. Uh, it's everything in one, 
it's anhydrous uh, magnesium chloride. And uh, I guess the other half is anhydrous also, which means there's no water content in it. So it's very, very light. Uh, it's crazy. When you mix that up, I guess I'll just go into it. When I mix up my magnesium and you add the powder to your solution of water, which in this case is RODI water, uh, that powder hits it. It crackles a little bit like fireworks and you smell sulfur. It's crazy. But it uh, works great. And uh, today's measurement of my tank was around 1300. So I'm happy. Uh, I'd like it to be a little bit higher if I could get it higher. Now, for some reason, I don't know where I came up with this, and I've had a few people ask me, you know, where did you get that information from? I don't remember. But for some reason, the general rule stuck in my head that I need to focus, uh, that I need to keep my calcium level, uh, how do I say this? The ideal magnesium level is three times the calcium level. So that's the crazy thing I came up with years ago. I don't know why. I, I, I'm sure I read it somewhere or I did some math, and I've been telling it to people ever since, but I've had a couple of chemists say, where did you come up with that? <laughs> so, of course, it makes me doubt myself a little bit. But if your calcium is at 400 and you do three times that, your magnesium should be at 1,200. If your calcium is 425, you're looking at 1,375. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, I hope that's right. I hate doing math on live, live streams. But uh, yeah, so I always recommend three times the magnesium of what your calcium level is. Now, how do you figure out how much you need? There are reef chemistry calculators on Google. You can literally type in reef chemistry calculator and boom, it comes up. The one that I like was written by Jay Dieck and a super nice guy. He wrote this many years ago and he gave it to the world. He said it's not to be charged. No company should own it. Um, I've asked permission to stick it on my website before, and he's actually said yes, but I just never followed through. Anyway, it's on Google, real easy. And when you go into the reef chemistry calculator, it's going to say what is the total water volume of your tank, and then what do you want to uh, raise or, or adjust. And you would put in alkalinity, and then it would say what kind of alkalinity are you adding. And you could say I'm using BRS2 part, I'm using uh, baking soda. I'm using baked baking soda. I'm using Fritz. I'm using, you know, whatever, you know, there's a bunch of brands that are in there. And then it'll say, uh, what is your current number? What do you want your number to be? Calculate. And then it'll say, you need this much more to bring that number up to your goal. It's a really nice calculator. And it works for magnesium, it works for calcium, it works for alkalinity. And it's a really good way to understand what you need and then figure out how much to dose accordingly. So in real numbers, if your tank was 100 gallons and your alkalinity was 6 and you'd prefer it to be 8.5 and you're using uh, baked baking soda or what's called soda ash, you would put that in and it would say you need, I don't know, 97 milliliters of alkalinity. So if you dosed 97 milliliters and you measured your tank about 20 minutes later, it should be at the number that you've desired. Now, how do you keep it at that number? Because you're not going to keep putting in 97 milliliters every single day. So here's the next step you have to do with some math. And basically, all you're going to do is you're going to not dose any alkalinity today, tomorrow, or the third day. You're just going to measure the tank's alkalinity, and then you're not going to dose any alkalinity for three days. And on the third day, or let's say the fourth, you measure your tank, and you see how much it came down gradually. Now you can divide that by three, and you'll know how much was consumed per day, and you'll know how much to dose per day. I hope that makes sense. Um, I haven't had to do that in forever, so I'm operating off of memory. But basically, you're trying to get the average consumption used per day of each element you're trying to add, and then figure up the number. Now, of course, you can ask others online, how much are you dosing for this size tank? And hopefully, there's people out there that will be happy to help you. I can tell you a long, long time ago, when I had my 29-gallon reef, I was dosing B-Ionic. It's made by ESV. I love that stuff. It's super easy, no mixing. It's just bottles of liquid. And for my little tiny tank, I didn't need much. I was using 15 milliliters a day of part one and 15 milliliters a day of part two. And in general speak, we usually dose equal parts of part one and part two or calcium and alkalinity. That's how it normally works. Uh, but we have become more fine tuned and we have discovered that with the use of dosing pumps, that we can dose a little bit more alkalinity per day, a little less calcium, um, and still stay right on target. So you're gonna dial it in and it's gonna take some time. Uh, it can be frustrating, 
you know, as you're going through this uh, first few weeks of trying to get it set up correctly. And there's other things that I'm going to tell you now that I want you to do that will make your life easier. Uh, number one, the tubes that are trickling it in if you're using a dosing pump, you want to make sure they're above the water line. It does not help to have them under the water line. Um, you would think that they wouldn't clog because they're sitting in salt water, but they actually clog up even more easily. So you want them, you know, like if here's your water line, you want your tube right above it so it's trickling in. And I would recommend at least once a week you push the test button on your doser and make sure liquid comes out of all, all the tubes. Uh, in my case, there's three. So I would say check alkalinity, then check calcium, then check magnesium. You're not going to hurt the tank hitting it for a couple of seconds, and you can verify visually that liquid is coming out. If liquid is not coming out, there's a couple of reasons why. No, number one, the vessel is empty, so there's no more to add. And number two, the uh, chance that there is a crack in the tubing, and it's sucking in air, and so it cannot create the vacuum to move the liquid through the line. Or number three, the tube is clogged, and you just have to like roll it between your fingertips, and it'll crush the powder out, and it falls into your sump. Or I guess you could dose directly in your display tank if you wanted to. So let's get into that part. As you're dosing, you always want to dose into an area of high flow. If you just trickle it into a kind of a dormant area of your tank or the back corner or something like that, or, or corner of the sump, what you will discover over time is that you're going to have all this weird stuff building up on the walls of the sump and the base. And it's not mixing properly. Some of it is, but some of it's just kind of like gluing to the walls of your vessel. And so what I did in my own sump where I dosed the three part is I put a little tiny itty bitty adorable power head that points straight up and it's sitting right under the dosing tubes. So it shoots water up, the tubes are right here, and whenever it trickles in, there's actually a mound of water on top of the skimmers, you know, because it's in the skimmer department, compartment. And the, uh, the liquid rises a little bit, so it's, it's churning, which tells me the pump is still running, which I keep it on 24 hours a day. I don't make that pump turn on and off, I just let it run, I don't care. If anything, it keeps detritus and suspension a little bit better so the skimmer can pull it out. And then my liquid hits that that little water volcano and it mixes it quickly into the system so that way it's being distributed and not being wasted and you know what all that buildup i was seeing evaporated it just vanished i never saw it again so from time to time you're going to need to clean that pump but that was my method of making sure it mixes if you are pouring it in by hand like a uh, like a you know you're dealing with a smaller tank so you don't need dosing pumps you want to pour it, like if you have a power head and it's shooting water out, do it right into that jet of water and pour it in very gradually. Like 15 milliliters is nothing. That's three little syringes, right? I would pour that in for 30 seconds. So I'm barely trickling it in. So it's just like hitting the water. Tick, 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 tick. I want to get all of that mixed. If you dump it in all at once, it was like, Doom. okay, I did my dose. Doom. I did the other one. What can happen is it can turn to flakes. And what it has done is it has become a particulate and it becomes uh, essentially worthless to your tank. You're not benefiting your tank. You want it to mix in well and go into your system. So those are my thoughts on dosing and I wanted to tell you that. Um, Fun with Reefing quickly asked, what brands of two-part have you used? I've used ESV's Bionic, which is awesome. I have used Sea Balance from Two Little Fishies. And for the last year, I've been using ME Coral. And he has these three packages that are very simple. You just tear off the top and you pour it into uh, a gallon of RODI water. Uh, I'm kind of rolling my eyes because alkalinity is a gallon, calcium is a gallon, magnesium is half a gallon. So you need to know that. And the magnesium mix uh, is actually a two-part. So you have to put in one part and then you add the second one. Just follow the directions on the package. It's really easy. Uh, I've never tried any of the stuff from BRS. I have made my own alkalinity by baking uh, baking soda. It's always hard to say baked baking soda. So uh, super easy way to make your own uh, soda ash. Baking soda is, uh, somebody tell me, somebody remind me, please. That would help because I'm drawing a blank. Let me have a sip of my coffee. Maybe I'll wake up. Uh, let me Google it. Baking soda. I'm sorry, guys. Baking soda is bicarbonate. I hope I have this right. And then baked 
baking soda is sodium carbonate. If I have those backwards, I'm sorry. You know, you can Google it yourself later. But when you bake the baking soda, you're driving the CO2 out of the powder, and it becomes soda ash. And everyone knows soda... Well, I mean, I'm going to say everyone. A lot of people know soda ash is what you want to use to dose your tank. Very few people want to dose just baking soda right out of the box because it can depress your pH because of the CO2 trapped in the powder. So we want to make sure we don't do that. Um, so how do you do it? It's super easy. You go buy a box of baking soda, Arm & Hammer baking soda, the same stuff people put in the fridge to get rid of smells. You buy a box of that for 99 cents at Walmart. You pour it on a cookie sheet so it's all level, you know, it's a little tiny layer all the way across the pan. You set your oven for 275 and uh, let it warm up. It'll take like five minutes. And then once it's at 275, slide the cookie sheet in there and let it bake for 45 minutes and then take it out and let it cool and pour it into a Tupperware container, done. You've got your own soda ash, cost you 99 cents. Um, when you wanna make a gallon of alkalinity solution, you take two cups of that powder that you've baked, mix it with a gallon of RODI, and boom, you've got your alkalinity solution. Super cheap, super easy, super convenient. It's what I've been doing forever. I'm seeing all these answers. <laughs> Everyone says sodium bicarbonate, so I really hope the popular answer is the correct one. And uh, so it must be after it's baked, it's sodium carbonate. Let me do that one. Baking. Let me change it to soda ash. Yeah, it becomes sodium carbonate. All right, good. So we, we got it right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate the assist. Um, calcium, you can use uh, calcium chloride. Um, and uh, that's easy to get everywhere. All the online e-tailers sell it. I sell ME Coral uh, additives. If you need them, they're on my website. And again, I should be saying, hi, my name is Mark Levinson, and I run Milo's Reef. Please buy something from my website today. All right. <laughs> the uh, magnesium, years ago, you could use something that came from, uh, like, the hardware store. And they used it to melt ice on the roads. And we don't have it here in Texas, so I'm super jealous. But you could buy this giant bag, 40 pounds worth. And uh, they called it driveway heat, I believe it was called. And you could mix that up and make your own uh, magnesium. It was awesome. That with a little bit of Epsom salt, you'd combine those two parts. And there's an article that I can link. Well, I guess I will. I'll just link it in the end of this description later on. Uh, it's written by Randy Holmes Farley, and it's the recipe for two-part dosing. I don't know if you guys care that much about the chemistry behind it, but it's a massive write-up and he goes into every detail. And he is the one that told us how to make our own two-part years ago. It was your DIY two-part solution, and then even added magnesium to the article. It's huge, and it's very detailed. And uh, it may be more than your brain can handle. And that's not an insult because it's more than my brain can handle. I just basically love to get to his articles and get to the bottom where it says, in conclusion, and read the paragraph. Because it's I mean, he's a chemist. He knows his stuff. And I'm just like, wow. But he, he came up with this idea or this recommendation, this system, and it later became what we see today is available everywhere. And the funny thing is, is because of his DIY and all of his, rec his recommendations from you know, 15 years ago, everyone's dosing. Even giant reef tanks, they're dosing instead of using a calcium reactor, which as your tank gets bigger and bigger, I feel like it's really preferable to go to a calcium reactor. And yes, that video is coming. I was on, uh, on the phone with Marine Depot because I was trying to buy a special component for this video and they didn't stock it anymore. So I gotta buy it somewhere else. And I basically don't wanna do the video until I have all the parts because it'll be an educational video. It's not gonna be a product review. It's gonna be a, this is how you do it. And I don't really wanna use all my crusty old salt covered stuff. I wanna use shiny new things. So I'm gonna buy a pH controller I already have CO2 tanks. I already have the reactor from Marine Depot. I've got the, uh, the regulator that I'm gonna recommend. And I've got the media. I just need that one thing, the pH controller. I gotta place that order. I just gotta order it like today or something. Okay, um, I wanna give you guys some updates on some stuff because um, you know I've got your attention. This is the perfect time. So I rolled out a couple of videos this week. I don't know if you saw them yet. One was the tank tour that our club did where we visited six different tanks on the same day as a group. About 45 of us all jumped in our cars and went to each other's homes, and uh, we had a great time. And I, if you're in a club, I recommend your club organize a tank tour. 
And if you are not in a club and you just want to find some way to do that through the internet, then I would recommend it too. Because finding people in your local area with aquariums is super fun. And you get a chance to talk with them and see what they've done and compare it to what you're doing and learn. Uh, you see great ideas. Like for example, while I was at the very first house, he had this controller under his aquarium that if you watch the video very closely, the numbers are doing some really weird thing on my camera. My camera was capturing it very strangely. Like it was just like changing. I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. And then of course, when I got it close, of course it, the LCD looked completely normal. Anyway, the controller was called an Inkbird and he uses it to turn on a fan or to turn on a heater to keep his tank going. And I've never heard of it. And uh, it could be because I've never had a small tank in forever. <laughs> I, I, if I had known about the Inkbird back when I had my three gallon Pico, I would have been super happy because it would have turned my lights on and off or would have turned on the heater or, or actually really would have turned on a cooling fan because that was the problem. That tank would get hot. And that thing, apparently everyone knows about it but me. So anyway, it's in the video. If you're interested in this thing, it, it's nifty and you can take a peek at it really quick. Um, and then, you know, we got to go see Ryan's thousand gallon reef and I barely showed it because he wasn't happy with his tank. And I, I felt like if he's not happy, I don't really want to go into a lot of detail. Um, I know that we will be filming it in the future because he's a local member and he's a personal friend of mine. And when he's ready to share that tank, you know, we're going to do a full on thing and it'll be awesome. And I'm hoping to get a hold of Tammy this week to see if I can run over there and film her excellent setup that you also saw in that video. So that's exciting. So, okay, that was that. Last night I rolled out a video twice. I uploaded it first and the sound was bad and I deleted it and re-uploaded and added a little bit of extra footage, just two minutes long. But it was an internal overflow box that I built and it was huge. It was the biggest one I've made so far. And it was heavy. And it's gonna go in the middle of an aquarium. Not like the middle back, but like dead center because I think they'll be able to walk all the way around the aquarium. So you need a tower overflow in that situation to hide the plumbing that runs vertically in the center of the tank. So I made that and I, I showcased it and I was proud of it. Again, it was sort of like the uh, Vortec uh, cage that I made. I was able to cut it so precisely on my CNC machine that I didn't cut through the paper underneath, which that's a goal. And I've been running my CNC now for almost a year and a half and I've learned a lot in a year and a half and I've made my share of mistakes. And uh, I was really pleased with my ability to cut all the acrylic and not quite the paper backing that's crazy super thin. You know, it's like 0 0.015 of an inch thick and I didn't perforate it. <laughs> and why would that matter? <clears throat> when you're cutting acrylic on a machine like that, if you cut all the way through down to the table, the piece itself will move. Uh, even though it's held down with a vacuum, it can move. And if you cut too deep, you cut your table underneath. If you can cut down to the paper, nothing moves. And then when your project is done, you can take a razor blade and cut the paper and remove the item and things look perfect. And so of course my goal always is perfection. And that's what I was doing with that. So I showed, I showed that in the video last night. Now, um, the other, I mentioned the cage. The cage is doing really well. It's been on my tank now for a couple of weeks. I had someone recently ask me, uh, when will those be available for sale? I uh, wanted to try and I've got a, uh, a, what do I call it? A guinea pig anemone sitting inside my auto feeder. I mean, he's literally under the auto feeder, completely in my Eheim chimney that I call it. So, you know, I've got this Eheim pump and I make this acrylic bracket and the food goes into that and then the fish can eat it and it doesn't go down the drain. That's the whole point. Well, this anemone has crawled inside it and it's like grabbing all the food. And then of course the clowns slam into it because they're not scared of anemones, but that thing's in my way. So I'm gonna peel it out of there and I'm gonna put it on the cage and I'm gonna see what happens because I wanna know for a fact if the cage has enough surface area that an anemone is safe to crawl off of it without being damaged. And I believe so. I believe that that is the case. I put my hand on it to feel and it wasn't some kind of crazy suction. Uh, some people had made the comment on that video that the tentacles could get sucked in. Well, yeah, tentacles could get sucked into any pump um, especially depending on the direction of the flow. In my tank, the way the flow is coming from the wall of the tank, it's pushing the tentacles that way. And while there's some that are kind of being pulled, you know, as water moves back into the pump to do the circular motion, they're pretty far away from it. But if one was crawling across it, where would the tentacles be? If the foot is sitting on the acrylic box, the tentacles are facing away from the pump, so it should be fine. 
Uh, if the thing was just tumbling through the water and tumbled into the cage, what would happen? I don't know. I kind of want to see what would happen. So that is on my list of things to do. Um, I see someone talking about phosphate reducers. Uh, Dino Fernando asks, is it true that bio pellets and phosphate reducers don't work well hand in hand? Um, I have not heard that. I've run uh, bio pellets for a long time, and currently I'm not. Uh, I was really hoping the, the brick that was supposed to remove nitrate would work, and so I removed the bio pellets intentionally to see if it, the brick would work. Tested my nitrates today, and they're still well over 25, so clearly my brick is not doing anything, and I have to make a change. Um, and I ran it with phosphate RX. Now, are you s concerned that running bio pellets with GFO would be a problem? Because for a while there, I'd heard about a product that was all in one. And basically, it was a bio pellet wrapped in GFO thrown in a reactor. And the idea is it would do both. Uh, I don't know that I like that one because bio pellets have to tumble. And as these pellets are tumbling against each other, they're going to grind off all of that GFO, and that GFO will then become into suspension and could essentially flow back up into your display tank and affect your fish's gills. So we don't want the GFO fines to get in your display tank. That's why it's so important they have very low flow going through a GFO reactor, and it's why I don't even run one. <laughs> I don't use GFO. I use Phosphate RX. And uh, the bio pellets desire, uh, design is to remove nitrate. The... Uh, GFO or phosphate RX, which is lanthanum chloride, is to remove phosphate. So you got nitrate, you got phosphate. Neither one does both, and uh, each one has its own job. They should be able to work in conjunction. All right. Um, I felt like I had more news for you, and I didn't write it down. That was my mistake. So. I guess we'll address some of your questions. Let me scroll up. There's no questions. It's all talk. Uh, somebody says that you can get the ink bird from BRS. So it's a fun name. I mean, it's a strange name for a controller, but as long as you know what it's called, you can go find it. Yeah, I see nothing else here. Uh, someone mentioned in here I've lost a lot of weight. Uh, it's very strange. I am thinner, and I'm happy about that. That was my goal. But uh, on the scale, I've lost a literal, since January 1st, I've lost six pounds. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, so let's talk about that for a minute, since I have some time to kill waiting for your pictures to show up, uh, your questions to show up. Um, I did the fitness thing for 90 days. That was my goal. I got a personal trainer. I tried to eat right. I tried to learn how to use all the machines because I'm not a gym guy and I know nothing about the equipment there. And uh, I listened to what my trainer said. I tried to do what she recommended. If something was hurting, I said, can we build up to that? Because I don't want to say I can't or I won't. I just said I'm not. I don't think I'm ready for that yet. And uh, because I actually pulled like a muscle or two. And so we worked around that trouble area until I was you know, better again. And then I'd continue back into my routine. But the one thing that I am going to tell you guys that sounds counterintuitive, but I'm sure there is science behind it, is that you can eat food and lose weight. And uh, I went on my vacation for eight days and I was in Arizona and I could not control what I'm eating other than, you know, especially if food's being put in front of you. Like when you're a family, here's your plate. And they, they put the food in front of you. You don't have a choice. You can't say, well, I really wanted, you know, you eat what you're given. But uh, when you go out to eat, you can pick a little bit. But again, it's restaurant food. And a lot of times restaurant food can be quite heavy. But bottom line is after eight days, I went up half a pound. I was really proud of myself because you just never know. And uh, I'm not cutting things out entirely. Like for example, I'm still eating chocolate. Uh, I, uh, I still like sweets. I've had pastries, um, so I mean, that's still in there. But I was told by my trainer after the 90 days, uh, you know, when we get into month number four, when my heart was no longer into it, <laughs> I just, I had set my brain mentally to 90 days. That was my goal. I didn't want to go to a gym for the rest of my life. 
And so I told myself, you know, that's it. And that once we hit April, I was kind of like, eh, you know, because I did it. I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. But she gave me an eating plan that has really been helpful. And it involved eating lots of veggies and lots of uh, greens and less carbs. So I've reduced the amount of carbs I used to consume. I love carbs. I love bread. I love uh, bagels and you know, stuff like that. And I, um, I'm eating less of them now than I did previously. And I cook a lot of food. I'm so sick of washing dishes. <laughs> I'm washing dishes. I'm washing pots and pans. Ugh, it just seems to never end. But uh, no, I'm eating really big meals. And uh, I'm not gaining weight. And I'm, I'm kind of sticking where I'm at, which is awesome. I'm loving that I'm maintaining and it's not something that's kind of going back up because I stopped going to the gym. Uh, and I've actually been wanting to get back to the gym some more, uh, kind of just work on building up my arms a little bit. <laughs> it's vanity, I admit it. All right. <laughs> Robert, all I can say is when a plate is put in front of me, I'll eat what I can eat, and I will stop when I'm full. So if your mom got mad at me, I can't do anything about that. I'm, I, my best friend's mother, when she, see, when she saw me last, said, you're too skinny, you need to, you know, put on some weight. And uh, that was when I was over, you know, more overweight. And her, uh, my best friend said, you know, that's what my mom always says to everyone. And, you know, I, I don't care what her mom says. <laughs> if her mom wants me to be fatter, that's her call. I know what I want when I look in the mirror. And matter of fact, I'm still not quite where I'd like to be. That's a personal preference, obviously. So, yeah, I feel like when you lose weight... You feel better about yourself, and it affects your entire personality, your whole look. And I think, you know, like someone says, you look younger. <laughs> it's kind of true. I mean, it's funny. The older I get, the younger I am. And it lets me continue to lie and say I'm 39 forever. So, I mean, you know, 39. So that means this year I was born in 1970, right? Got to make sure I keep up with these numbers. Or I don't know. Something like that. I had a 79. <laughs> I got to work on my lying. I'm not good at that. I'm, I'm really good at honesty. So, uh, but I like to say 39 forever. Uh, and I learned that from my father, actually. For many, many years, you know, every year, birthday, he'd say, I'm 39. So I never knew his true age. And it's very ironic because now my father always says, do you know that you are this many years old? And he's the only one that reminds me. I mean, even the police don't remind me if I get pulled over for speeding. They just look at the ID. Or when you get carded at a restaurant. And I love getting carded. That's great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I like to watch their eyebrows go up. You know, that's funny. So, um, let's see, Dino. I'll look and see if I can find your other message. Okay, so what you're talking about, you'd heard that biopilots need some phosphate to work. You're talking about the red field ratio, I believe it's called. And I have not read up on that, so I've avoided the topic entirely. But your tank is going to always have some phosphate and some nitrate. Always going to have some. If you have zero nitrate, zero phosphate, typically the reef doesn't do well. The livestock doesn't fare well in that super low nutrient situation. Now, I know people desire it. People have craved it. But we, again, oh, God, it just seems like everything we humans do, we follow a pendulum effect. And instead of just being right in the middle and, you know, just be balanced, we go to this extreme, and then we go to that extreme. And we go to this extreme where, you know, we want lots of alkalinity. And then, you know, then we go to this one. We want to have zero nitrate, zero phosphate, where what you want is like two, three ppm nitrate. Phosphate, you want a little tiny bit, 0 0.03 ppm. Uh, there are phosphate checkers on the market that measure in parts per billion instead of parts per million. And, you know, I, I was asked, do you want this checker? I'm like, no, I don't want one that low. My water will never be that low. Matter of fact, today, my reef is measuring 0.5 ppm. So I, I don't fear it. My buddy Richard Ross in California has a beautiful reef tank, and his phosphate was measuring 0.5 to 1.0. And he had nitrates around 40. And uh, his reef was doing fine. So those of you with these goals to have super low, perfect numbers... I'm more about how's your reef doing? How's your livestock doing? And matter of fact, I had mentioned this in a previous video. I had talked with uh, Sean from Fritz, 
and I was telling him I'm kind of on the fence about just changing some really big amounts of water on my reef, like change 400 gallons in a week, you know, on a 400 gallon reef and just get the nitrates out of there because I'm sick of them being so high. And he said, but your corals are beautiful. Why would you do that? And he's kind of right. I mean, why would I shock my system trying to hit some number that I'd like to hit when my reef is growing just fine? Now, if your tank is filled with algae and you know, you've got all these plagues going on, I understand trying to fix water quality. But if everything's doing well in your tank and you see it growing and you're not watching things dying, per perhaps the pursuit of the perfect number is a bad choice. So we wanna dose what's appropriate for our tank. We wanna maintain what the corals need. We wanna have patience and let things grow slowly because nothing grows quickly in a reef tank unless it's bad news. Um, my, my little anemone has become a beast, right? It's two feet in diameter. That thing was, you know, it was a cute little thing in a bag of water when I bought it and it was adorable. And now it's, well, I mean, it's a showpiece and I love it, but dang, that thing kills everything because it just hugs everything. Um, but my, water, my nitrates aren't affecting it. My phosphates aren't affecting it. My alkalinity, my calcium, my magnesium are not affecting it. Um, let me uh, also mention really quickly that uh, while I was away, my alkalinity climbed up. And I'm telling you this as a cautionary tale or a precautionary tale because it's gonna, it keeps you apprised of what to watch out for with your own tank. I was out of town. I got a text from my tank sitter who said, your alkalinity is too high. It's measuring 16. I turned off your calcium reactor. And I instantly wrote him back. Are you still at my house? Because typically when he writes me, it's four hours later. <laughs> and, you know, of course he didn't answer fast enough. So I called him. Are you at my house? And he's like, no, I left that a long time ago. And I said, okay, do not turn that calcium reactor back on. Because when you turn off anything on a reef tank, any kind of reactor, like you close a valve or you turn off a pump and the water's just sitting there stagnant, it's gonna become anoxic. The oxygen level drops, it becomes sulfuric. And then when you turn that thing back on, it's gonna flow all that toxic water back into your reef and affect your livestock. So we don't ever wanna do that. And so I told him, don't do anything. I know you turned it off, that's fine, thank you. Uh, when I get home, I'll drain the reactor and I'll turn it back on. All you have to do is pour out the liquid. Just don't let that sulfuric stuff stay in your system. So if you turn off a GFO reactor, if you turn off a biopellet reactor, if you turn off a carbon reactor and it's still in the system, drain it, clean it out, reset. Um, in my case, he left it off for a day and a half, I guess. And then I get a text. I turned it back on. <laughs> of course, I'm just like, what? And then I, he said, don't worry, I drained it. I was like, okay, and uh, all is well. And alkalinity today was 10, so uh, crisis averted. But yes, anytime something is off or there's an extended power outage and you have water sitting stagnant for a long time in any area of your tank, including the overflow box, drain that water out, throw it away. If the water in the sump sat stagnant, throw it away, make new salt water, refill the sump, um, and then get your system going again. Uh, you should already have battery backups on the pumps in your display to keep the livestock alive. But watch out for those things that um, are sitting stagnant, even six hours, 12 hours, dangerous, and you don't want to do that to your tank. So think ahead. And if you have a tank sitter helping you, explain that to them. And if you don't remember and they text you, instantly get a hold of them and tell them, you know, don't turn it back on later. I know you're trying to be helpful. <laughs> you know, or tell them what they have to do. I'm sorry, but now you're gonna have to take it out of the sump and you gotta go to the sink, you have to dump it out. You're gonna put in a half a cup of carbon. You got to add some water. You got to rinse it. You got to, and they're like, they'll, they'll probably never touch your stuff again. <laughs> All right. Um, I see someone talking about trace elements. Trace elements are always included in your salt mix. And if you're changing your, your water on a regular basis, you're adding trace ele elements automatically. If you're dosing something like I do, Prodibio, I'm adding some of those elements back into my system. You've got Bioptim and you've got BioDigest. They're both two types of bacteria. Then they have the Strontium and they have the Iodine and I'm adding those. They have one that's called, uh, I think it's called Vita Plus and it's vitamins. It smells like orange juice. <laughs> and they have Reef Booster, which is a food. And uh, these are their basic additives that I use in my aquarium. Uh, I don't use the Vita or the uh, Reef Booster very much because uh, usually it takes a long time for my skimmer to recover after using that. It, it really affects the water surface tension. So I, I use the other ones. And today is the, what's today? 16th. So in four days, on the 20th, I dose Prodivio. 
um, and then on the fifth. I always do it two times a month every 15 days. And that is my way of adding extra stuff to the water because I do water changes so rarely. I can't even remember the last water change I did. Um, I really don't. November, October, maybe it's in my blog. I don't know. I, if I blogged about it, it, it's because it was a momentous occasion because I finally did one. But I haven't done one in a while. And part of the reason I didn't is I wanted to see if the brick would work. So you see, I mean, you know, it, there's a method to my madness besides my laziness. And uh, my reef continues to live in spite of me. That is my favorite saying. All right, guys. Uh, we've been in here for almost an hour. I'm going to stop. I hope that those of you that are dosing or wanting to dose, that this information was helpful. And, uh, of course, there will be links in the description. There are lots of dosing pumps on the market. I'm using the one from IceCap, and I was going to recommend that. But, unfortunately, I'm told that those are no longer available. So there's lots of other brands out there. Check for... Um, product reviews from others to see if they're happy with it, uh, check for warranties, um, see how many dosing heads you need or if it's expandable, and uh, that way you can determine what you want to buy. Uh, you definitely want to verify that it's dosing the proper amount from time to time, um, such as if you're dosing 15 milliliters, you should put a thing under there where you can measure that 15 milliliters is actually coming out at least once a month. Verify that the number is true on the dosing pump and that that's exactly how much liquid is coming out, or calibrate it to get it back on track. And then lastly, please do your water testing. I did mine, so you guys need to do yours. And uh, post your results. I like it when you post them on Instagram. I always recommend that uh, you, you put a hashtag, post your results, has, hashtag water testing, at Me Loves Reef. If you want to find me, you can find me on Facebook, at Me Loves Reef, on Instagram, at Me Loves Reef. And of course, you found me here on YouTube. If you're not a subscriber to this channel, you're welcome to subscribe. And if you click the little bell and the notifications are turned on in your phone for this app, you'll be told when I have appeared on YouTube. You might even get.